Welcome to lecture 6.8 in possibility proofs. This follows off of the material from lecture 6.7 on ruler and compass constructions. So please watch that first if you have not already. We'll begin with a brief history of these problems. Now I talked about this in the previous lecture, so I'm going to go a lot quicker through this version. So Plato, who lived in the 5th century BC, believed that the only perfect geometric figures were the straight line and the circle. In ancient Greek geometry, this philosophy meant that there were only two instruments available to perform geometric constructions. There is the ruler, which is a single unmarked straight edge, and a compass, which collapses when lifted from the page. Formally, this means that the only permissible constructions are those granted by Euclid's first three postulates. Around 300 BC, the ancient Greek mathematician Euclid wrote a series of 13 books that he called the Elements. This is a collection of definitions, postulates, or axioms, and theorems and proofs covering geometry, elementary number theory, and the Greeks' geometric algebra. You may notice that the term Euclidean geometry is named after Euclid. Book 1 contained Euclid's famous 10 postulates and other basic propositions of geometry. Recall that the first three postulates essentially formalized ruler and compass constructions. The first postulate said that a straight line segment can always be drawn joining any two points using a ruler. The second said that any straight line segment can be extended indefinitely in a straight line. And the third said that given any straight line segment, a circle can be drawn having the segment as radius and one endpoint as center. Using only a ruler and compass, or in other words using these three postulates, Lines can be divided into equal segments, angles can be bisected, parallel lines can be drawn, n-gons can be squared, and so on. However, there were three seemingly basic constructions for which the ancient Greeks could not solve. And these remained unsolved for over 2,000 years until the development of field theory. In the last lecture, we looked into this and we understood that the constructible numbers formed a field, and we gave precise conditions on to when a number was constructible. And here is the short version of that theorem. Well, first it says that the set, henceforth k, of constructible numbers is a field, and if alpha is a constructible number, meaning we can construct it using a ruler and a compass from a line segment of length 1, then the degree of the extension of q adjoint alpha over q is some power of 2. So we will use this to prove the impossibility of the three basic constructions that stumped mankind for over 2,000 years, namely squaring the circle, doubling the cube, and trisecting an angle. To do this, let's go back and restate these problems in the language of field theory. So the first problem of squaring the circle says, Given a circle of radius r, and hence of area pi r squared, construct a square of the same area. So area pi r squared, and hence the side length is the square root of pi times r. If one could square the circle, then the square root of pi would be in k, which is the field of constructible numbers. However, this field, q adjoined the square root of pi, a claim does not even have finite degree over q, so it can't have degree 2 to the n. And to see why, notice that q adjoined root pi is a bigger field than q adjoined pi. Now why? Well, pi is clearly in both of these fields, because I can take the square root of pi and square it to get pi. However, the square root of pi cannot be constructed from pi using just arithmetic. So the degree of q adjoined root pi over q has to be at least as large as the degree of q adjoined pi over q, which is infinite because pi is a transcendental number. It is not the root of a polynomial with integer coefficients. That is a fact that was proven in the 19th century. Hence, the square root of pi is not constructible. Next, 
Problem 2. Doubling the cube. Formally, this says, given a cube of length L, side length L, and hence of volume L cubed, construct a cube of twice the volume. In other words, 2 L cubed. Therefore, the side length has to be the cube root of 2 times L. If one could double the cube, then the cube root of 2 would be constructible. However, we've seen that Q adjoined the cube root of 2 is a degree 3 extension over Q, and 3 is not a power of 2. Hence, the cube root of 2 is not constructible, so the cube cannot be doubled. It really is that simple. Problem 3. Trisecting an angle. Formally, this says, given e to the i theta, construct e to the i theta over 3. Now let me draw a picture of that. Here's the complex plane. So if we have an angle theta, then this point on the unit circle is going to be e to the i theta. And, well, let me draw the unit circle, approximate it here. Maybe that's not perfect, but it doesn't really matter. So what we have to do is we have to construct, we have to trisect the angle, so we have to construct this point on the unit circle, which has angle theta over 3, so this point is e to the i theta over 3. Now if you prefer, I say equivalently, you can construct the cosine of theta over 3 from the cosine of theta. So this is just, instead of taking the complex number x plus yi, we're taking just the, the x value of that. Let me drop this down here. So if we project this down here, this is the cosine of theta. And if we drop this down here, then this is the cosine of theta over 3. Because again, this is the real part, and the, or axis, and this is the imaginary axis. So in the last lecture, we talked about how this construction in the complex plane is equivalent to this construction on the real axis, just doing the real parts. We will show that an angle of 60 degrees cannot be trisected. So note that I'm not saying that we can't trisect any angle. I'm just saying that we can't trisect every angle. So all we have to do is come up with an angle for which it doesn't work. So in other words, we will show that the cosine of 20 degrees, which is called that alpha, cannot be constructed from the cosine of 60 degrees. Now, there is a triple angle formula, which none of us probably know off the top of our head, and that's fine. But it says that the cosine of theta equals 4 cosine cubed of theta over 3 minus 3 cosine of theta over 3. So let's let theta be 60 degrees, and then let's plug that into this formula above. So let's plug this into the equation above. So the left-hand side... Cosine of theta is just one half, cosine of 60. Recall that alpha is the cosine of 20, which we claim is non-constructible. So this here becomes alpha cubed, and this becomes alpha. And when we simplify, we get the following simple algebraic equation. 4 alpha cubed minus 3 alpha minus 1 half equals 0. So let's solve this for alpha. One way to do this is to change variables by letting u equal 2 alpha and plugging this back in and multiplying through by 2 which yields the equation u cubed minus 3u minus 1 equals 0. Now I'll let you as an exercise verify that this polynomial is indeed irreducible. Now it doesn't follow directly from Eisenstein so it takes a little bit of work but it can be done. And what this means is that u is the root of the irreducible polynomial x cubed minus 3x minus 1. Therefore, q adjoined u is a degree 3 extension over q, because the degree of the polynomial is 3. And 3 is not a power of 2. 
Therefore, u, which is 2 times the cosine of 20 degrees, is not constructible. So neither is half of that, which is alpha, or the cosine of 20. In summary, the three classical ruler and compass constructions that stumped the ancient Greeks when translated into the language of field theory are as follows. Problem 1, squaring the circle, becomes the problem of constructing root pi from 1. The second problem, doubling the cube, becomes the problem of constructing the cube root of 2 from 1. And finally, the third problem, trisecting an angle, becomes the construction of the cosine of theta over 3 from the cosine of theta, which for certain angles of theta will work. So one that it does not work for is 60 degrees. In other words, construct the cosine of 20 degrees from 1. Since none of these numbers, the ones in blue, meaning root pi, cube root of 2, or the cosine of 20, lie in an extension of the rationals of degree 2 to the n, they are not constructible. Now, I should mention that if one is allowed to use a so-called marked ruler, which is just a straight edge with markings on the side that can be used in the construction process, then these three constructions become possible. And this is something that the ancient Greeks were aware of. However, you still need more information than just Euclid's three postulates. The ancient Greeks were also interested in constructing regular polygons using just a ruler and a compass. They knew constructions for 3, 5, and 15 gons. In 1796, 19 year old Carl Frederick Gauss, who was undecided about whether to study mathematics or languages, discovered how to construct a regular 17 gon. Gauss was so pleased with his discovery that he dedicated his life to mathematics. Gauss is known for many things in math and physics, but he also proved the following theorem about which n-gons are constructible. Now I should be careful, and I should say that I think Gauss actually stated this. He came up with this theorem, and it wasn't proved until Watzel came along years later. This says that if p is an odd prime, basically not equal to 2, then a regular p-gon is constructible if and only if p is equal to 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 for some integer n. The next natural question to ask is, for which n is this quantity 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 prime? Because when it is, we have a polygon that we can construct with just a ruler and a compass. This motivates the following definition. The nth Fermat number, denoted Fn, is 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1. If Fn happens to be prime, then we say it's a Fermat prime. It's easy to check that the first few Fermat primes are F0 is 3, 2 to the 2 to the 0 plus 1, F1 is 5, F2 is 17, F3 is 257, and F4 is 65,537. These are named after the 17th century French mathematician Pierre Fermat, who conjectured that all Fermat numbers are prime. Because why not? The first five are. The pattern is obvious, right? Unfortunately for Fermat, in 1732, the Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler disproved Fermat's conjecture by demonstrating that the fifth Fermat number, F5, or 2 to the 2 to the 5 plus 1, or 2 to the 32 plus 1, this is some 4.2 billion, factors as a product of two primes, namely 641 times 6,700,417. Now, he did this all, of course, without the use of a computer. It is not known to this day in 2016, if any other Fermat primes exist. So far, every Fermat number is known to be composite up to F32. 
That's all. That's incredible. We don't know if F33 is composite. And actually, we don't even know the complete factorization of these Fermat numbers past, I think, n equals 11. However, we do know a lot of larger Fermat numbers that happen to be composite. The largest of these was discovered in 2014 when a computer showed that 193 times 2 to the 3,329,782 plus 1, which by the way is prime, is a prime factor of the Fermat number F3,329,780 which of course is 2 to the 2 to the, that big number plus 1 I don't know if it helps, that is greater than 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 6. So I don't know if that helps or makes it worse, but it's, it's huge, and that factor, that number, is in fact composite. Recall that we became interested in Fermat numbers and Fermat primes after the results of Gauss and Wanzel that said a regular n-gon is constructible with a ruler and a compass if n is a Fermat prime. So this gives a sufficient condition for a regular n-gon to be constructible. In fact, Wanzel proved a necessary condition as well, giving a complete classification for which regular n-gons are constructible. And here's that theorem. It says a regular n-gon is constructible by a ruler and compass if and only if n is the product of a power of two and a power of distinct Fermat primes. If these type of problems interest you, I encourage you to pick up a book or a paper and learn some number theory or take a class in it. At Clemson, that class would be Math 4100.